Hello, it's January and there are a lot of things behind us right now, but right now there are still local vegetables that are available at the farmers markets and maybe some of the grocery stores. So in this video, I'm going to talk about some things that you can do with them, both prepping and saving for later, as well as offer a few recipes you might want to try to use these vegetables while they're still in season locally. This can be a really helpful thing if you're just looking for some different ideas. Sometimes I like to just go to the farmer's market or the grocery store and pick up something that I haven't used in a while and then go search for a recipe for it. So that can be one way to find something different or you can choose one of the recipes I recommend here and then go shopping for it or go looking through some cookbooks of your own or on the internet looking for some recipes for these kinds of, of vegetables. First, we're going to talk a little bit about how to store and prepare these vegetables. Um, one thing that you want to think about is when you're storing them for longer term, either at room temperature or in the fridge, depending on what the best way to, to store them is, you don't want to wash anything until you're ready to use it. Washing it can put it at risk of becoming overly moist. And for vegetables that don't want the extra moisture, then you're going to put it at risk of, of going off faster. You also want to make sure that it has no bad spots, otherwise it's not going to store as long. As you can see here, I have a head of cabbage that has some bad spots on it. And so if I were to plan to keep this longer term in the refrigerator, in the crisper drawer, then I would want to take the outer layers off. But if I get through and I find out that there are some bad spots that go all the way through, then I would probably go ahead and just blanch, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a couple of minutes and just freeze it so that it's ready to go because blanching would help to stop any deterioration of the produce. I also have some tables to look at that are helpful for just thinking about all of the varieties of vegetables that you can find right now locally in central PA that deal with how you, how you should store these vegetables in the refrigerator or in your pantry. I'm not going to talk about all of these. You can take a screenshot of it if you'd like or come back to the video later, or you can find this information other places in cookbooks perhaps or on the internet. But the basic idea is that you want to pay attention to whether or not the vegetables are best stored in the fridge or pantry because temperature can make a difference. And even with things that can store at pantry temperatures, putting them in the refrigerator may not be an awful thing to do, but for longer term storage, you may not want them in the refrigerator because the refrigerator might be a bit too moist. So do pay attention to how they should be stored, whether it's the fridge or the pantry. That having been said, there are times when I have stored sweet potatoes and regular potatoes in the refrigerator if I just didn't have the right spot to store them. The apartment that I lived in prior to the place I'm currently in, I didn't have a basement or any really cool dry place. So I just would keep my potatoes in the refrigerator in the crisper drawer. So if you're in that kind of situation, just know that they probably won't last quite as long as if you can store them in a basement pantry type situation. But then other things that need to be in the fridge, do put them in the fridge or else freeze them if you don't have fridge space for it. The other thing I should say before going to the next slide is some of these things should be wrapped in a, in a towel. The reason that they're recommended to be wrapped in a moist towel or a dry towel has to do with how they store best. So pay attention to that as well. Cab cabbage, for example, if I pull off the outer leaves and find that underneath it's fine. I could just wrap a damp towel around it and put it in a plastic bag in the fridge in the crisper drawer. Um, same goes for kale and spinach as well as collard greens. But then other things I would want to have wrapped in a dry towel because you don't want to 
expose it to too much extra moisture. So pay attention to these things when you're thinking about longer term storage, especially. The other thing to think about is if you are looking to store this because the vegetables are going to go off and you don't have time to use them or because you just know that you don't have enough space in your fridge or your pantry or you just want to keep them longer term than the few weeks that they might keep in the fridge or the pantry, you can freeze a lot of things. The question is, and you can freeze most things actually, the question really is how should you freeze it? So this table hopefully gives you a handy guide for the kinds of things you can find locally right now in central PA. And this is true for other things as well. So you can always check a cookbook or the internet for tips on how to freeze other vegetables and fruits if they're not listed here. But most things you shouldn't actually freeze raw because freezing raw can break down the molecular structures that, that affect the flavor, the color, and the textures of foods. So if it says don't freeze it raw, you really don't want to freeze it raw. Cruciferous vegetables, for example, especially Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, if you freeze those raw, within a couple of weeks, they're going to start turning bitter. Now you can freeze the leafy green varieties for up to a month, but beyond that, they can start to turn bitter too. So that's when you want to either cook them fully so that they're ready to go and you can just pull them out, defrost them and heat them up quickly, or you want to blanch them, which will help to preserve them in a way that you can freeze them and pull them out later and do whatever you want with them, cook them fully in another way. Blanching is a really great thing to get into the habit of doing if you are the kind of person who buys things when they're available, either because they're on sale or because they look really good at a certain time and then you find that you don't have time to do anything with it or you bought it and you plan to do something with it and then something happened and you didn't do that. That happens to me a lot. I have what I might call recipe and cookbook ADD. I have a tendency to buy something and think, oh, I wanna make that with it. And then two, three, four days go by and I'm in the mood for something else or I ran across something else that I needed to use up or just really wanted to make. And so I end up having to do something else with the produce. So blanching is a great way to either get stuff that is going to go off saved so that it can go into the freezer for later use or just to save it for later period because you know that these vegetables are not around locally and fresh all the time or you just don't have time right now for much else and it's right there and you don't want it to go to waste. But blanching is going to help to enhance colors. It protects the flavors so that certain foods that don't become, that it protect, prevents them from becoming bitter when you freeze them. It helps to seal in nutrients and it helps to protect the texture. Yes, when you freeze something inevitably, it is going to be softer than it was when it was fresh, but blanching it is going to help to protect it more than just freezing it raw. So if you're trying to keep a little bit of that crunch to the cauliflower, blanch it, freeze it, it won't turn bitter, can still have a little bit of crunch to it. Or if you find that you have digestive issues with some of these vegetables, blanching it and freezing it can also help to make it easier to digest. And it can be helpful too if you have a recipe like a stir fry that calls for you to quickly cook something like broccoli that requires more time than the recipe might prefer. And in that case, you can have blanched broccoli ready to go in the freezer and it'll, it'll cook up much faster when you're ready to use it in a stir fry. So the steps to blanch are here and follow the guidelines either on the table that I provided or in a cookbook or online somewhere because different vegetables, depending on how thick they are, take more or less time to blanch. But generally we're talking between two and five minutes at the most, five thicker vegetables like cruciferous vegetables and and um, potatoes and only a couple of minutes for most leafy greens. So pay attention to that and just make sure that 
you run cold water over it for several minutes. That's what stops the cooking process once you take it out of the water. You can, you can steam or you can boil. Either one works. I usually steam, but you could also boil whatever is easier for you. Pull it out of the water, run the cold water over it, and then let it drain and go ahead and freeze it. Another thing to think about, and then we'll talk a bit about some specific things you can do with vegetables to enjoy them. Blanching is something that I do when I don't know how I'm going to use something. So if I have a large head of cauliflower and I only need a portion of it right now, I will blanch the rest of it and freeze it because I don't know what I'll do with it next. It also will help if I see that, for example, the Brussels sprouts that I bought are going to go off soon because they've got little spots on them. I will go ahead and blanch them and put them in the freezer for later. And I also blanch broccoli and cauliflower anytime I'm making a stir fry of any kind or a curry even because those don't cook for as long. And so it helps to make these things a little bit softer and they cook faster but I will cook something completely when I bought it and I know what I'm going to do with it and I want to have something ready to go for later. One example is making soups and things like that, but another example is Brussels sprouts or something that I don't generally blanch. I would blanch them if I'm making them, if I'm putting them in a stir fry, but otherwise Brussels sprouts, I generally, because there's something that I just eat as a side dish or that I put in something like a burrito for some extra fiber, I might reduce the, the rice or just do all Brussels sprouts instead of rice or cauliflower instead of rice inside a Brussels sprout. In those cases, um, I want something that's cooked completely. So for me, Brussels sprouts are something I want ready to go. I just want to defrost it and reheat it and know I can eat them. So Brussels sprouts, I always fully cook. I roast them and then I freeze them, but it might be different for you. So think about what works for you. Cauliflower and broccoli, I generally blanch because more often than not, I put them in something, but Brussels sprouts, I generally eat on their own as a side dish or they go whole and ready to go into something quick like a burrito. I want to talk about a couple of things that you can get locally right now that will store for a certain period of time. Potatoes tend to store for a decent amount of time, a few weeks or even a couple of months, depending on the quality of the potatoes when you got them and the temperature and conditions where you're storing them. But you can still find, even if you've got good storage conditions, that sometimes those potatoes are, are going off. And if you're like me and you don't want to waste anything, one thing that you can do if you're not ready to just eat them, you can go ahead and blanch them. And when you blanch, you want to cut things up the way you're probably going to use them when you actually cook them. So peel them if you always peel your potatoes or leave the skins on if you prefer, but definitely wash them and cut them up into the sizes and shapes that you're interested in. You can freeze your own french fries for later use if you just cut into strips or wedges the way you like french fries and then blanch them. And you can go ahead and put them in the freezer and pull them out and basically cook them the way you would other french fries that you would when you buy the, the frozen potatoes. So probably somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes, depending on the thickness of the potato. Basically, that's what you're buying when you buy frozen potatoes. And it's perfectly fine to buy them that way. They're easy and ready to go. But if you have potatoes that need to be used up, and you're not ready to cook and don't feel like cooking, this is a way to get them into the freezer for later use. Another thing that I personally find I don't always need a whole amount of, and this happened to me over the holiday because I got some mushrooms before New Year's. I usually keep them around, especially this time of year, because there are more limited types of local vegetables available right now, and mushrooms can be helpful for adding flavor to things. And I also cook a lot of things that call for mushrooms. 
but I didn't need all of the mushrooms that I got. So what I did this time was I dried them and I'll be able to use them later for recipes and they will have more flavor because drying them breaks down the amino acids, the proteins into simpler proteins and that apparently helps to boost the flavor. You can also put them in a stock if you have looked at the, the vegetable broth video that I made, you could put them in a stock and make a stock for yourself or you can roast them and freeze them. And there are instructions here for drying mushrooms. The, the instructions say to do this at 150, that is ideal, but not all ovens will go that low. Mine only goes to 170, so I do that at 170. Do make sure that they, it's below 200 though, because you don't want it too high. Just make sure that you are checking it more frequently if you have to do it above 150. I checked it at 45 minutes and turned them over and then checked them after another 45 since I did them at 175, but they still took some more time. It depends on the variety of mushroom, the temperature, as well as how thick you cut your slices. But this is a great way to preserve mushrooms if you don't know what to do with them because you ended up with more. Since mushrooms often come, especially at the farmer's market, they often come in a, a pint or a quart size. This is, this is great. And if you're the kind of person who looks for recipes, a lot of East Asian recipes will call for dried mushrooms. You'll have them ready to go. That's how I will use them. So it's helpful for me to have them. You do want to pat them dry before you put them on a baking sheet. So I put them in a container that allowed them to spread out a bit in a towel and then close the towel and patted them dry and then placed them on a baking sheet like this in a single layer. And uh, I can show you what they look like now that they're dried. So they should be crispy. If they feel spongy at all, when you pull them out of the oven, you want to make sure that you put them back in because they should be crispy. If you pick them up and you can squeeze them at all, then definitely put them back in the oven. You also want to make sure that you let them cool just a little bit um, before, you, before you test them. It's fine if they're out of the oven for five minutes or so so that they can cool and then test them when they're cool to see if they're actually crispy. They will crispen up once they've, once they've cooled off. So those are some tips for how to handle some of the vegetables that are available right now. And in the rest of the video, I'm going to offer some recipes that will allow you to use some of these vegetables. Some of them are spicy if you like spicy foods and some of them are not. So I'm offering some options for different kinds of preferences. The first thing is scotch broth. And this is traditionally a lamb broth based dish. So you could also do it with beef if you like meat. Beef is the usual substitute for people who aren't using lamb. So you, you can make your own broth with lamb bone or beef bone and then add the vegetables as well as the barley and maybe the, the yellow or green split peas. Or if you don't want the meat, then you can always do it as a vegan, basically a com completely plant-based recipe. You can also, this, this is one of those recipes where you can substitute vegetables, use what you've got in your fridge and pantry, which is why I like this recipe this time of year. I can pick out what's available from the farmer's market and throw that into the soup. Just make sure you have about eight to 10 cups of raw chopped vegetables and you'll be good to go. So here's the recipe. I'm not going to make it here today. I actually made some yesterday to use some of the vegetables that I got at the farmer's market. The, the main things I would say, other than what I already said about, if you want to cook it with meat, you can do that. Start with that and then add the other things later. And I have a note here about how you can do that if you want to start with a meat base. But if you want to go meatless, then you can basically 
follow the recipe with the ingredients on the left and the steps one through four that I have here. If you are making it without meat, you can enhance the flavor a bit by adding some soy sauce, tamari, or liquid aminos, as I suggest here. You could also instead add a little bit of wine at the very end if you like to do something like that. Uh, a vinegar would enhance the flavor as well. Um, I, I added some liquid aminos to mine and that adds some color too because it darkens up the broth a little bit. So you can do what you'd like. You can season it as you'd like as well. It's generally an herb seasoned soup. So if that's the kind of thing that you and your family like, then this might be a recipe that's worth trying. Another recipe that I like to make this time of year because it's uh, what I call an anything but the kitchen sink kind of soup is Ukrainian borscht. This is not necessarily a soup for everybody. It's not spicy, but it does have its own unique flavor. So if you look at the ingredients and you're not sure, I understand that's your choice. But if you've had any kind of beetroot soup before, doesn't have to be Ukrainian, you'll, you'll know what the flavor is like because beets are a bit sweet. And the borscht also calls for a little bit of vinegar, which makes it a sweet and tangy kind of soup. And then there's a little bit of fresh dill that you add as well, or you could use some dried dill weed, which gives it a hint of pickles, but not a strong flavor. And since this isn't anything but the kitchen sink kind of soup, you can again use whatever you've got that's available produce wise. Just don't forget the beets. Borscht in Russian and Ukrainian, it, it translates from the, the, the name of the soup basically is the same root as the word beet. It means beetroot soup. So you have to have beets. They can be red or they can be white, but everything else is negotiable. And if you do use red beets, I recommend that you prepare them with gloves to avoid staining your hands, unless you are practicing for a role as Lady Macbeth and it would be helpful for your hands to be stained red. This is the recipe for borscht that I personally recommend. And at the top, I have the suggestion of what to do if you'd like to use meat, chicken is Chicken or pork are more traditional for borscht because of the region that, they, that it comes from. And uh, the more chicken and, and pork are common in the, in the countries that make the different varieties of beetroot soup. So those are the ones I'd recommend if you're going to do any kind of meat. I make it without because I don't eat meat anymore. And for me, cabbage is quintessential to this soup because my Ukrainian friend who first made it for me always made it with cabbage, but you don't have to use cabbage if you don't want to. You can always use kale or you could use chard, something like that, or you could just skip the cabbage completely. But follow this recipe and the hardest part of it is probably prepping the, beet, the beets, maybe shredding the cabbage if you've got, but if you've got a food processor, it should shred it up pretty easily for you. You can also, you can also chop it. I like my beets shredded or grated, but I will usually chop the cabbage. So it depends on you and what you prefer. Do what you like. And uh, this is going to be something different. So if you're looking for something different and the flavors that are here are something that you would like, as I said, it's a kind of sweet and tangy soup. And that can be some different if you're looking for something different to try. The third soup I'm recommending is a spicier one for people who like spicy food. And this one also uses the, some of the vegetables that are available right now, and it's a nice hearty soup. This one doesn't call for any meat, but you could always have it alongside some meat if you want to eat meat. But if you don't need the meat, this can be a meal by itself because it calls for lentils, which give you some protein. But you'll want some winter squash and some sweet potatoes for this. And then you could also throw in some kale or some spinach if you'd like 
You could throw in a little bit of cauliflower if you wanted to, maybe reduce the amounts of the squash and the sweet potatoes a little bit. Cauliflower is good for soaking up the, the flavor of spices. And the only other thing I would say about this, you can follow the recipe as it is here. If you want to substitute because coconut milk is high in saturated fat, you could cut out this, this coconut milk and you could use diced tomatoes you'll end up with a tangier soup and you're probably going to have more spice because the coconut milk will temper some of the spices, but tomatoes are actually probably going to soak up the flavor of the spices and enhance them a bit more. So know that before you decide to substitute and you can even reduce the seasoning just a little bit if you want to substitute tomatoes and are afraid that it might be too spicy. But this is a great soup this time of year, really hearty, and it uses things that you can find locally. And then if you're looking for something that's not a soup, this is, January is National Soup Month, so it's a good time to be making soups because of the vegetables that we do have around locally right now. But another thing I can recommend is something called curry fried rice, which I discovered several years ago when I was in Philly and I just fell in love with it. So I started searching for recipes. And at this point, I pretty much have come up with my own variation of it. But my understanding of basically the curry fried rice that I had in Philly and the recipes that I found looking for, for it is this is another kind of anything but the kitchen sink type of dish, but it's a fried rice dish rather than a soup. You can use what you've got on hand just make sure that you aren't using too many vegetables. You don't want to go overboard, but I tend to put more veggies than rice in mine. You just might need to add a little bit more seasoning if that's the case. So this is the recipe that I have pretty much tailored over the past several years as I have experimented. You can follow this, you can do your own, if you have your own fried rice recipe that you already like, basically what you do is at the end, you add about a tablespoon of curry powder for every four cups of rice and vegetables. So if you follow this recipe to the letter, you're going to have exactly the proportions you need. If you're good at judging these things, you can, or you can measure things as you go along and get a sense of how much cooked rice you've got versus how much in the way of raw vegetables you're adding to your dish. But you can do what you want with this and use different things. You can make this with eggs. You could add some cooked meat if you'd like to. And you might just reduce the eggs and the vegetables a little bit in that case, or you can increase the seasonings. You can also do, since this is kind of an, uh, a recipe that allows for you to use a lot of different veggies, since it's an amalgam of different cultures, you could always just do a plain fried rice recipe if you're not a fan of curry and know that you can go beyond those basic veggies that we're used to seeing in fried rice and add whatever you've got in your pantry that you'd like to use up. So those are the suggestions that I have. Using the local vegetables, I do this year round. I mostly shop at the farmer's markets. And then if I can't get something that I really need or want, I will go to the grocery store and supplement. But I love to shop at the farmer's markets because I'm, I'm supporting local farmers. Or if you can get that at the grocery store, you're still supporting the local farmers. But it's also more nutritious because when things are picked at peak, ripeness instead of being picked early to distribute across the country or across the globe sometimes, they're going to have enough time for the nutrients to develop more completely. They're also going to just be more flavorful if they've developed, if they've ripened completely. And I just find, as I said earlier, that this is a way to help me kind of find inspiration for things to cook because we all get in a rut sometimes and January can be a time when we especially feel kind of like we're in a rut with a lot of things and this can be a way to kind of give you some motivation to do something different if you find some vegetables that are available locally and you start looking for recipes whether it's the ones I've offered here or something else go out and explore 
and find some things that will use these local vegetables because they're healthier for you and they're supporting our local farmers. I hope that this video has been helpful and I will see you next time for the next season of Good, probably not until the spring.